Hi everyone, my name's Stuart Room and welcome to my channel on all things to do with data, privacy and security. So, 25th of January is Burns Day. It's a day to celebrate Scotland's national poet, Robbie Burns. And if you have Scottish ancestry, like I do, it's a date you're going to have in your calendar. So what happens on Burns Day is people come together to celebrate uh, Robbie Burns' life and to recite his poems and to give an address to the haggis, uh, Scotland's national delicacy, and also to imbibe copious amounts of Scotland's finest whisky. And if you are slightly immature, uh, then you will certainly drink too much and wow, I've overindulged on many, many occasions. And that's left me with fantastic headaches, superb hangovers, and many, many days off work as a result. Now, none of that misfortune compares to the misfortune that famous comedy actor Gordon Case suffered on Burns Day 1990. So on the 25th and 26th of January 1990, the UK was gripped by dreadful storms and Wow, I, I really remember those days. I, I was in London at the time, I think, uh, for an interview or a meeting. I can't remember exactly why. But I do remember being in an office building while these storms were going on and just, just looking out the window at the carnage that was unfolding before me. So roof tiles were blowing off the roofs, landing on cars in the street. Uh, people were ducking for shelter, you know, running into uh, doorways to hide. It, it was frightening. And the storms caused massive devastation, including loss of life. Now, on the 25th of January, uh, Gordon Kay was driving through London. Um, and as he was passing a ho advertising hoarding on the side of the road, uh, it became dislodged and a plank of wood blew from it and landed on the windscreen of his car. And poor Gordon Kay suffered the most dreadful head injury. And the actor Gordon Kay, who plays the bartender in BBC television's Allo Allo, was seriously injured when a plank of wood flew through the windscreen of his car. He's being treated at a London hospital. So Mr Kay was rushed to Charing Cross Hospital, admitted to intensive care, where he stayed for three days. Now, because he was famous, uh, the hospital was aware that there was a risk that the press and media would uh, descend on the premises in order to try and find out what was happening, potential well-wishers uh, might turn up too. So they put in place security measures to prevent uh, anyone from disturbing uh, Mr. K and the treatment that he was receiving. Let me tell you a little bit more about uh, Mr. K. He played uh, a character called René Artois in a long-running sitcom uh, called Allo Allo about the French resistance. And it's hard to really exaggerate how massive this TV programme was, uh, but it ran for an entire decade from 1982. And back in the day, uh, we didn't have uh, Netflix streaming or anything like that. We just had a few terrestrial channels to choose from. Uh, so that meant that families would congregate around the TV in the living room and, and get together in their many millions to watch programmes like Hello, Hello. So he was a big star and the press interest in such an accident in the context of such an awesome storm was obvious. So let's imagine the scene for a moment. We've got a famous actor in hospital, a massive injury, it's all over the news and there will be press encamped outside trying to uh, get scoops and updates. So what happened is, is a journalist and a photographer uh, from the Sunday Sport newspaper, uh, they posing as doctors, uh, they got through security and actually managed to get into uh, Mr K's room. And they conducted an interview with him and took photographs of him. Now, what was really 
concerning about this intrusion. Of course, this was a highly private situation, uh, but seemingly Mr. K participated uh, with the interview and the photographs on a consensual basis. But actually, the evidence was uh, that within half an hour of the journalist and photographer being rumbled, Mr. K had no recollection of the interview and the photographing whatsoever. And that really does tell you all you need to know about the question of consent. Hold on a sec. Gordon Kay is in Eloa Low, and there's another famous privacy case called Douglas against Hello. There might be an article here. Now, this isn't actually a video about privacy in the press, and it's certainly not a video about knocking the press. The point I'd like to make about the press is that the British press, the, the quality investigative journalists, play a massive role in the maintenance of civil liberties, uh, the maintenance and health of our democracy, for example, by holding politicians and other people like that to account. We've got fantastic investigative journalists, fantastic newspapers in this country. And the Sunday Sport, Mr. K had some really good friends, and once the uh, intrusion had been discovered, uh, they set about helping him to protect his position, and solicitors were instructed to try and restrain the publication of the interview and the photographs. But back in 1990, there was no legal right to privacy that the courts would protect. So the lawyers had to be inventive and they brought proceedings under various other legal grounds. Uh, but the proceedings failed and uh, the press were free to uh, use the materials. The only restraint that uh, was placed upon them by the courts uh, was to prevent them from asserting that the interview uh, had been uh, done with consent. And this is what the judge had to say about this legal problem around privacy. So all of that was 30 years ago. And golly, I remember where I was 30 years ago. I was finishing university, uh, looking forward to starting my training to become a barrister. And back in the day, we didn't have protection for privacy. But here we are now, three decades later, and the legal protections are strong. Uh, we know where we stand on all uh, issues around privacy. Uh, the law is crystal clear, not just in the UK and in Europe, but elsewhere. There are no disputes around the ambit and scope of legal protections. Everyone knows where they stand. What an amazing development we've seen over the past 30 years. Yeah, maybe not. So concepts of privacy cover a huge amount of ground. We've got the idea of the private space, and in the K case, the private space was a physical space inside a hospital. Uh, but nowadays, we have virtual spaces, cyberspace, the digital environment. You know, other ideas within privacy are about how privacy is circumvented. You know, who invades our privacy? Is it a public authority? Is it a private entity? What are the reasons behind an invasion of privacy? What, what are people seeking to achieve? And then we have the tools of privacy invasion. So it's done in particular ways. Now, in the K case, one of the tools was the camera. And that's what I'd really like to focus on in this video. The camera occupies a very special place in the world of privacy. The reason, well, you all know the phrase, you know, a picture can tell a thousand words. We get much more out of the image 
in terms of what's communicated to us than we do through uh, simple words and phrases. And the ubiquity of the camera is, of course, at its very heart of penetrativeness. So I'm speaking to an iPhone. We've all got smartphones and the camera is combined with a device that is our full computing suite. So the camera is always with us. And we have cameras built into many, many other objects and devices. So if you think about uh, home surveillance now, one of the uh, big Internet of Things ideas is you will buy surveillance cameras, stick them on your front door uh, as part of the doorbell uh, solution and in other places in the house. And you only need to walk down the street to see CCTV cameras all around you on public transport. There are cameras uh, in the coaches, uh, you go into shops and restaurants, they're, they're on the wall. But but that that's, of course, only half of the story. The, the other issue within the camera is the ease of sharing and reproduction of uh, information. So, so when I was growing up, um, cameras were analog devices with film in them. And the entire photographic record of my life from you know, a baby up until my mid thirties, perhaps later, is held in a shoebox uh, in my loft. And, but now I'm taking literally hundreds of photographs uh, a week, you know, of my kids, of things around me, things I'm interested in. And that ease of photographic creation combined with the ease of reproduction and sharing is what makes the topic of camera so, so fascinating in the privacy space. So in the olden days, when it was the day of film inside a camera, uh, producing a photograph was a real pain. So you'd have to go and physically buy a film from somewhere, put it in the camera, uh, you take photographs and then you had to go and get the film developed. So that meant either going off to the, the chemist or sending it somewhere for production by mail order. And then what you get back at considerable cost uh, would be 20 or blurred snaps uh, with a thumb in front of the lens and loads of red eye, if not complete darkness. The biggest issue in the camera privacy space right now is automated facial recognition. And there have been calls for this technology to be banned. There was newspaper reports actually on this only last week saying that the European Commission is considering the introduction of a temporary ban, whatever that may mean. Uh, some privacy activists are using different phraseology that comes to the same point, arguing that there should be an ethical pause on the use and rollout of facial recognition technologies in order to give uh, the community of experts in this space enough time to consider the implications of the use of AFR and the kind of controls that could be put in place to ensure that AFR does not constitute a disproportionate, unwarranted invasion of privacy. The conversation about bans has actually moved past a mere conversation in some places. Already, uh, some cities in the United States, San Francisco is a notable example, have implemented facial recognition bans. Now, there are many use cases for AFR. Uh, so, for instance, it can be used as a tool of law enforcement. Uh, but in our day-to-day -day lives, we're using AFR on our smartphones every single day uh, through a facial recognition access control. Um, we're also seeing facial recognition being used for fun. So the latest generation of selfie devices uh, enables your face to be mapped into a cartoon environment. And in our daily experiences, AFR has the capability to make life just much more convenient for us. So if you've been through an airport in the early hours of the morning when uh, the custom control isn't well staffed, it's kind of a blessing to see the booths that you can walk to, put your passport in, it can do a scan of your face and you can get through. 
Now, if Dante was looking for a 10th circle of hell, uh, that would be JFK Airport in the early hours when you're flying in uh, from Europe because you're going to be queuing for hours and hours and hours, just hoping that on the next visit, there's going to be a booth that you can walk up to and show your lovely face. For understandable reasons, people are worried about the privacy issues involved. And the major use case right now is about uh, law enforcement and policing. Uh, so again, newspaper reports in January uh, this year about a football match in Wales uh, said that people were protesting, football spectators were protesting at the presence of AFR surveillance units uh, from uh, Welsh uh, police forces that were present outside the uh, football ground. Uh, people were turning up wearing masks, uh, scarves to, uh, to, to hide their faces from these cameras. And this has been a really serious issue. Uh, in 2019, litigation was commenced about trials in policing in Wales uh, that went uh, to court. I'll come back to that shortly, but we've got to give the idea of surveillance all due respect because surveillance is a massive invasion of privacy. I mentioned earlier the idea of the private space. Now, concepts of privacy mean that public areas can be private spaces. So it doesn't have to be a space that is privately owned. Now, a lot of the controversy around uh, facial recognition concerns surveillance in generally public places, so outside football grounds, in the street, etc. But the controversy has moved into privately owned spaces as well. Of course, there are places that are hybrid owned and controlled, part publicly owned, part privately owned, or part publicly controlled, privately controlled. A mixture of these ideas is possible. And we're already detecting in those spaces a concern on the behalf of developers to distance themselves from some of the facial recognition controversies. Now, the core argument about surveillance is simply this. We, we should not be subject to indiscriminate mass surveillance. We should not have to live in a surveillance society. So a fundamental human right of privacy is always going to place limitations on the ability of law enforcement agencies uh, and other bodies of the state to engage in mass surveillance. There's been lots of litigation around that recently. Uh, when we look at the mass surveillance issue more broadly, uh, we only need to think back to the days of Edward Snowden, not too long ago, roughly 2012, uh, that revealed the prism and tempora mass surveillance system that was being developed by the US and the UK and other intelligence authorities. And, and that created a massive, massive sense of moral panic once the stories broke. And as the stories then developed, that they also revealed considerable elements of illegality. And we need to remember that mass surveillance doesn't have to lead to an actual negative outcome, a negative event for individuals in order for it to be illegal. If it is mass surveillance and it isn't done on a proportionate basis, the argument is it's illegal without anything else. For example, one of the concerns that privacy activists will raise is that a mass surveillance culture can just have a chilling effect on how we live our lives, how we go about our ordinary business. You see, it's considered and accepted that for us to thrive as human beings, we should benefit from a private space. A private space allows us to develop dissenting thoughts, for example. It, it allows us to be safe from rogue actors, from a big brother threat. And there's this balance that needs to be achieved between the private space that we should enjoy just for our own mental health and well-being and the broader issues that society has got to concern itself with. 
around effective law enforcement. But if we just surveil everyone all the time, what effect is that going to have on us as people? So a mass surveillance system doesn't have to develop into an actual big brother society in order for us to be concerned about what's happening. It's the effect on how we go about our normal lives that's the concern that people have. The right to be let alone is central to concepts of privacy. And if we're really going to be let alone, doesn't that include the ability to just go about our daily business in public, in the streets, at football matches and places like that, without just being watched, without being treated as a walking ID card? We're fortunate to live in Western countries because there are many barriers standing in the way of the development of the Big Brother state, standing in the way of suppression and repression of people. But we only have to consider recent history to understand that surveillance has led to extremely negative outcomes on the continent of Europe. And if we go further afield right now across the world, there are many cases being reported of AFR being used to suppress minorities right now, right now, today. There are also concerns about the quality of some of the algorithms that underpin AFR. Now, these concerns are essentially about programmed in biases, if you like. Uh, there's an organisation in the US called NIST, which stands for the National Institute for Standards and Technology. And this conducts regular research into AFR software and algorithms. These software parcels are provided to NIST by various vendors and they're examined for questions of false positives. Now, the, the latest research, and I'll put links to this below, say that on one-to-one -one matching techniques, there are great disparities in false positives concerning African Americans and Asians versus Caucasians. The basic point here is that if you are of darker skin, then there is a greater chance of a false positive than if you are white. Now, that, that's, that's a troubling concern. But when you dig further in to the uh, study that NIST has published, you find that it's, it's a variable picture. Uh, there's more bias issues than just uh, African Americans. So, for example, on uh, one to many uh, matching techniques, uh, there are large disparities concerning uh, African -Ameri American women in contrast to Caucasians. So, so we, we have issues there. That there's other evidence about uh, native people in the states also being at that false positive disadvantage. Interestingly, however, the evidence seems to be that some of the software coming out of Asia doesn't have the same degree of disparities on Asian versus Caucasian false positives on one-to-one -one matching techniques. Now, as you dig into the report, you, you'll form your own views as to what this is actually saying. But the conclusion, at least in the summary report, is that it, it's not a single picture. Uh, there are variances between the s pieces of software. Uh, some software performs better than others. Uh, and the arguments presented that we need to look more into them in order to understand what's actually going on for demographic uh, uh, problems. But that's going to be cold comfort to you if you're of darker skin, if you're, fe if you're female. So let's tie that together. This false positive risk, imagine it playing out in a live environment on a one-to-many matching situation. So 
let, let's think about the scenario where, for example, there is uh, a serious villain uh, loose uh, in public uh, and the police are uh, rightfully concerned on making an arrest. Uh, the facts of that case might be such that as the facial recognition technology scans the public, a black female is at a greater risk of a wrongful arrest than I am. Now, how likely that is, I don't know. I haven't got the statistics about, about false arrests. But in a privacy concern sense, that is a concern that can't be ignored. So in my mind, the question is, what do we do about it? So is the remedy a ban, whether temporary or permanent? Honestly, I, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with the argument that we uh, should ban the technology. I think that that would be a precedent of unpredictable consequences. We, we haven't uh, yet experienced a situation where technological innovation has been uh, stopped, banned, if you like, uh, because of privacy concerns. I, I think we actually have to break the problem down uh, a little bit more. So one of the questions must be, can the software be improved if we are concerned about uh, these bias issues as, as we must? And pointing again to that NIST report, uh, potentially it's saying that the Asian software is performing better than some of the American equivalents. It also suggests that there should be further research into the technology. Now, what we can't avoid is the idea of live studies. At the end of the day, this technology is going to have to be put into a live environment in order to understand it properly, to understand the extent of the problem, and to enable the technologies to be improved, to be debugged. Uh, to enable any of these biases and inequalities to be properly addressed in code. And I think we also have to be clear about the use cases in which the discussion about a ban is presented. So I don't want AFR to be banned on my iPhone. Obviously, it's helpful. I would prefer to have a speedier passage through US Customs and through Heathrow when I'm travelling. I can see that there is potentially inside this technology the ability to solve very, very serious crime. Uh, we had a dreadful story uh, over the winter of people trafficking where many people died who were being trafficked across borders. Now, I don't have a position on how AFR might have helped in that particular case, uh, but in a borderless environment, we need to have something to help address the question of people trafficking. We've got concerns about the movement of terrorists. So law enforcement should have access to appropriate tools. And another question must be this, can the law cope? with the problems within AFR. And I'm confident that it can cope without a ban being necessary in order to create space for, the, for legal certainty to develop. I mean, the story I've presented about how privacy has evolved over 30 years and the story of Gordon Kay to now is a story where the law has itself assisted in the development and is to help, has helped to address and iron out very considerable problems and concerns. We've just adopted the GDPR. We've got data protection regulators. We've got a surveillance camera regulator. 
we've got the courts, we've got very, very bright civil liberties organisations, privacy activists. I think the law can cope with the questions within facial recognition technologies and the law should be given a chance to deal with these problems. And if we do have any unfortunate outcomes based around false positives and the idea of programmed in bias, then that should be dealt with. And there are arguments about how liability issues should evolve over coming years. Should liability rest simply on the organisation that uses the technology? Or are we starting to see a case to develop liabilities for the producers of technologies so that they're appropriately incentivized to ensure that the algorithms keep on improving. And I'd be highly optimistic that the algorithms will continue to improve because that is in the interest not only of society and the users of these technologies, but also the inventors and developers of them. I mean, a technology company that is putting into the marketplace substandard technology is soon going to lose out as the rest of the technology improves. There will be a survival of the fittest. And in my view, the fittest technology is the technology that is configured, is programmed, is coded to truly respect our privacy rights. And I also feel that there's a real space for better dialogue around serious privacy issues such as this. Bringing together the community of stakeholders for a better conversation, I think is key, not just in the context of AFR, but all technological innovations. I think that users of technology, the inventors of technology, should do more than just broadcast their position on things. That they would benefit by listening more to the concerns of the wider stakeholder community. Because if there's a better dialogue and the systems are less adversarial, then we can potentially remove a lot of the roadblocks that would stand unnecessarily in the way of improving the technology outcome that we'd all hope to achieve. So I'm going to publish links to some of the core materials below. I hope you'll find them useful. And if you like this video, can you give me a little thumbs up on the little thumbs up likey button? And if you would like to be updated on new content, you can subscribe on YouTube. There's a little bell button. If you press the bell, uh, you'll be notified as soon as my material is up. Now, in coming videos, I'm going to start looking at the question of ethics and where does ethics sit inside the data privacy environment. So I hope that will be of interest. I'm also going to explore further this question about how do we improve our communications? What I'm striving to put together is an argument that there is a clearer common ground that we can all move towards in order to help improve the state of data privacy. And also I'm going to be talking about something I call the journey to code. What that's about is achieving better data privacy outcomes inside technology and data themselves. So I hope you find that interesting. But I'm going to do more than that. Um, I'm going to publish legal updates. And I'm also going to uh, put some videos online about consumer protection, and consumer rights. So if you want to use your data privacy rights, um, I'm going to show you how you can do that, how you can write an appropriate letter, what that would say, what you can expect to achieve, how do you escalate things. So, so that should be helpful, I think. And I'm also going to give some practical uh, thoughts about how to improve 
your privacy experience online. Now, I'm really keen uh, to build up more relationships and a bigger community of, of, of people who are interested in some of these ideas. So if you're a privacy activist, a consumer champ, uh, if you are just a concerned individual, if you're a practicing lawyer, a management consultant, a regulator, whatever it may be, I think the more people who are involved in this space, the better it's going to be for all of us. So thanks for watching and see you next time.